Um, so if you would like to connect with our teams, uh, can, we would like for you to. The scripture says that the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. So if you would like to connect and help us grow, please fill out one of those forms um, to do that. Mind Detox, um, we are in a series called Conversations with Me. And if there is anything I do know as far as media is concerned, is that everyone in media is telling a story. Um, the thing about the stories is that, that they tell is that everybody who tells a story is telling the truth. They're just telling the truth according to the lens of which they view it. They're telling the truth according to the network that they're on, according to the audience that they have or whatever, but they're telling the truth. Whether that be Fox or whether that be NS, uh, MSNBC, and I want to give a shout out to our media and marketing team. Thank you for making our, our stage look the way that it does. And if some of you would like to connect with them to help us do more creative things, you can. But whether you're looking at Fox or CNN or whatever, everyone is hired to tell a story. And they all report a story according to the lens of which they have. And um, they, there's according to some audiences, some more conservative, some are more liberal. Um, it doesn't matter, but they all tell these particular stories. Uh, that's media. Now you bring that into the social media sphere and you find out that everybody in social media is telling a story. And according to them, the story that they tell is true. It's according to the lens of which they tell it and you just have to know the person that's telling the story before you believe it. Some people who post things on social media post them because they either have an audience or they post them because they need an audience. There are some people who post things on social media and they say things like, I'm lonely, I'm confused, I'm mad, or, or nobody loves me and all these things. And many times it's because they don't have an audience and they want attention. They want someone to connect with them. Then there are some people who have an audience and they uh, connect with people because they're encouraging them or they're challenging them or whatever. So everybody, whether that be media or social media, is telling a story. And it's just according to the uh, lens of the person who's telling the story that you know what version of the truth you're hearing. If you watch CNN, you can hear one version from this person. If you watch Fox, you hear another person person saying the same story, but saying it completely different according to the lens, according to their, their personality, or according to the audience of which they have. There are some people who uh, there's one version of themselves on Facebook, then there's another version of themselves on Twitter, then there's another version of themselves on a private Instagram page, then there's another version of themselves on Snapchat, then there's another version of themselves if they have a YouTube channel and you follow them. There's all these different versions of the truth. It's just according to the audience that they allow to follow them. I know where I'm headed today and I'm going somewhere. I'm not, I, I love, I'm just not saying the shout was authentic. I just want to make sure you leave out of here thinking about the conversations that we have with ourselves. So all of us have these media outlets of which we project stories and we project these ideas and we project these concepts, but we many times project them according to certain uh, filtered truths. What is interesting about that and the reason that I say that is that when it comes to freedom, when it comes to breakthrough, when it comes to deliverance, everybody's talking about it but not many people are experiencing it. And I'm confused just a little bit because everybody says they got it, but a lot of people aren't bearing the fruit of it. A lot of people say, I'm free, I'm delivered, I'm set free, I, I got Jesus and all these different things. But when it comes to when you start to see a version of them outside of here, many times the truth that they say in here is not the truth that you see outside of here. And it's a different version. It's not that it's not the same person. It's just that something hasn't matched up with each other. Um, and there's a conversation. So it's almost this media outlet. Everyone proclaims something in here when you're around other news reporters. When you're around other news reporters, you say things because you're around the media. But then when you get out there, you project something else because that is the world of which you live in or the people who actually might know you a little bit more than us. So it's interesting because when we get to here, we find out that 
I was, well, not just before I get to Galatians, because I have a few different things to say to you today, and I'm going to let you go eat your Mother's Day dinner. Uh, but it's so interesting to me because I was uh, looking at this week, because I want to make sure that I did honor women today, but there's one particular person that was really sticking out to me, and her name is Harriet Tubman. And what I remember, a particular line that Harriet said is she said, I have freed a thousand slaves, but I would have freed a thousand more if only they knew that they were slaves. She said, I freed a thousand, but I would have freed a thousand more if they only knew that they were slaves. And then I was watching a few weeks ago, I was watching an episode on the, on the show Underground, which comes on WGN. And there was a whole 55-minute or 50-minute dialogue that, that, uh, that uh, Harriet had with the audience. And she was telling about herself. And in that line, she started to reflect on how she came to be in the Moses that they now know her to be as a deliverer. And she said, I was trying to devise a plan to free my family on, pl on the plantation. We had walked it all out. We had talked all about it, about what we were going to do, when we were going to do it, and how far we were going to go, and how we were going to experience freedom. We, the day came for us to get off the plantation and we started our pursuit and we started running off the plantation. And while we were running off the plantation, we got about a mile into the journey and my brother looked over at me and he said, I can't go any further. I'm tired. I got to go back. He said, this is not worth it. I can't do this. We got to go back. And she said, do you want freedom? He said, I do, but I don't want it that bad. I, I got to go. We, we, we got to go backward. And it says that he convinced the whole rest of the family to go back. And Harriet went back to the thing that she was bound to. And she said that day that she decided never to try to convince anybody else of a freedom they didn't want. The people she was trying to free was her family. And sometimes the people that are the most bound are those that are close, most closest to you. And she said, I wanted to free my family, but I couldn't even free them because they weren't willing to run the distance. And she said, never again will I try to convince anybody else of freedom that they don't want for themselves. So it goes back to the line. She says that, that uh, I, I freed a thousand, but I would have freed a thousand more if they knew that they were, they knew that they were slaves. And then it goes on in here in this writer in Galatians, the fifth chapter and verse one, he writes off. He said, with freedom for freedom, Christ has set you free. He says, so don't be entangled again with the yoke. He said, Christ has set you free. Stand firm and be not entangled again with the yoke of slavery or the yoke of bondage. One translation says, so he says for he said for Christ has set you free now for those of you who have never read the scripture before he was saying Christ has set you free on the cross he's already done everything that needs to be done you don't have to do it anymore he's already done it Christ did not come to do away with the law but he came to fulfill the law you don't have to do anything else he says so you are enjoying a freedom that you didn't pay for but now you are trying now you are getting into rituals and to things that you were never designed to get into now you are starting to ascribe rules to yourself and now you're getting into legalism and God never designed for you to do that because he has set you free. So don't start ascribing rules to yourself that you don't need. And I'm trying to bring this down for those of you who are still looking as if you're a deer staring in headlights and you're like, what in the world did he see talking about? I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. And here it is. He says that you have been free but since you are free, you don't have to start adding work to your freedom. You couldn't set yourself free. So I sent Christ to do what you couldn't do. So now you are putting yourself back in bondage by adding work to stay free. What is interesting to me about this, Diana, what is interesting is because I was reading this, Miss Judy, and I'm sitting here saying, Harriet was trying to free slaves, but she couldn't free them because they didn't know that they were slaves. Here it is, the writer is writing the Galatians, and he's saying, stand firm in your freedom, and I don't want you to go back to any yoke of bondage. And I'm saying, why is Harriet saying she could have freed more slaves, but they didn't know that they were slaves? And why is he writing, and why is he saying, stand fast and stand firm in your freedom, and don't go back again? Why is he telling people, not to go back into slavery if they really understood what their freedom was. 
And I was trying to figure out what was really going on with this. And I said, Lord, why do people shout but not experience deliverance? I said, Lord, why do people sit in church and they don't like people? Why, does people? why do people speak in tongues before they forgive somebody? Why are people standing in unemployment offices and they're wanting a handout, but they don't give a hand down to anybody else? Why is the church so judgmental, Lord? What, what is going on with us? We, we have a good time on Sundays, but we don't do life very well. Why, why do we dress up to be so miserable? What, what is really... I've been asking this and I've been questioning God and I'm like, Lord, I'm confused as to why we who are supposed to be the church are the most bound people that I know. Why is it that the people in the streets seem more happy than the people in the church? And why are the marriages in the world better than the marriages that are in the church? And why are the people living large and in charge in the street, but the people in the church are broke? What is the issue? Why do the pastor's children have to be the worst ones? And everybody else is looking at the pastor's children and saying, why ain't they doing it? Why ain't they here? Why does everybody want to look at the speck in somebody else's eye but ignore the log in their eye? What is really going on with us? Why do people allow praise breaks to go on and worship opportunities and instead of us pressing in, we would rather look at it and critique it and say, I don't like it than to experience it. Why are we so bound why are we who are so spiritual yet so educated and our education causes us to miss you because we are so educated and we know the Greek and the Hebrew and we know the Herman Lewis and the Herman Lewis and we know all that stuff and it causes us to miss simple principles like love your neighbor as yourself why are we so deep but yet so shallow Lord, what's the real issue? And I've been asking. And I'm like, Lord, what is wrong with us? He said, detox. I said, what is detox about? And the definition of detox, if you put it up, the definition of detox is this. It's a process or period of time in which one abstains from or rids the body of toxic or unhealthy substances. It is the process or period of time of which one abstains from or rids the body of toxic or unhealthy substances. And I said, well, Lord, what does that have to do with what I'm saying? What does that have to do with conversation with me? He said, a lot of people get free, but they never detox from where they came from. So people get in a new environment, but they didn't detox from the environment they came from. So you who were not educated now got your education and now you got educated and now you think you're better than the people who are not educated because you didn't detox. You didn't detox from a classroom environment so now it's made you judgmental. So now you can't relate to your friends when you have your class reunion because you do have a little bit more education than the other people have because you have forgotten where you came from. I want you to look at someone and say, I didn't forget. I didn't forget. So he says here, he says, uh, Herod says, I want to free some more people, but I couldn't free them because they didn't know that they were slaves. And then after that, he says, but, but stand fast. He said, if Christ has set you free, don't be entangled again. And I said, Lord, well, what is the real issue? He said, it's the mind. It's the mind. The mind is messing us up. It's the mind that causes our feet to move, but our mind not to think. It is the mind that wants us to allow other people to do for us what we can actually do for ourselves. And I said, Lord, well, what is it that you would have for me to say to your people on this Mother's Day? Because it's going to go down in history. On Mother's Day, I heard a sermon talking about my mind. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to say to your people who are going to go out and cut steak after they leave? And what do you want me to say to your people that are going to sit there and drink and, and have a great time and, and be celebrated by their children? What do you want me to say? Because the interesting thing about the mind is that I love, and this is why he was saying to them, he said, uh, Paul was saying, he said, I want you to make sure that you don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. He said, because the only reason that rules were in place is so children can learn what not to do. Children had to have rules so that they would know what no means and they would know what yes means and they would know not to touch the hot stove and they would know all these different things. But I'm now telling you now that you're an adult, don't revert back to childish things. 
you are an adult now, supposed to be spiritually mature, so don't revert back to childish things where you need somebody to tell you not to do that, not to smoke that, not to drink that, not to cuss that, not to touch that. You don't need any rules because Christ has set you free. So according to your relationship with Christ, there are certain things that you should not do because my relationship tells me I won't. Not my rules, but my relationship tells me what I would not do. Someone say my relationship. So here it is. He says that there are some things that you've got to be detoxed as far as actually being able to understand freedom. And I said, Lord, what do we need to be detoxed from? And there's a few things that he told me, a few case in points, and I'm going to build on what I did last week. So this is basically part two of last week. So he said there are a few things that I want you to be detoxed from. And the first thing, Taka, that he says I want you to be detoxed from is ignorance. Got a scripture for it? You want to hear it? Here it goes. Here is Numbers, the 14th chapter. And verse 1, it says, Then all the congregation raised a loud voice, and the people wept that night. Help me, Jesus. And verse 2 says, And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Now, who is Moses and Aaron? And Moses and Aaron are leadership. Somebody say leadership. leadership. Say leadership one more time. He said in verse 2 says all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them would that we had died in the land of Egypt or oh, we wish that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by a sword? Our wives and our little children will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another let us choose a leader and go back to, to Egypt. Shalon, ignorance. Did I offend you? Did I make you feel bad? Because I said ignorance? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to know what ignorance is? Ignorance is asking God to deliver you, and then you want to find a way to get back in what you got delivered from. Happy Mother's Day. So here it is. These Israelites, these Egyptians, had asked God all their life for almost 400 years, Miss Bridget, for 400 years, they said, Lord, get us out of this. We want to be freed from bondage. We want to be freed from slavery. God raised up a Moses to free them and to get them out. Moses doubted himself, but God sent him back to the people to deliver them and to set them free. And once they got set free from the, from the bondage and they got set free from slavery, then they got in the wilderness and started to complain. This is the same scripture that I was talking about last week when Caleb came up and he said, give me this land, give me this mountain. Y'all remember that? Last week I was talking about that. This is why Caleb rose up. These are the verses before Caleb got up. He said, these people, we all asked God to deliver us. Now God has delivered us and now we're out here in transition complaining. Because what happens is, this is where Harriet Tubman comes in. I'm going to help you with your mind. This was ignorant. This is what happened. She said, I could not free a thousand more because they didn't know they were free. Why did they not know they were free? Because many people want to be delivered. But then to see the thing about bondage is that when you're in bondage, you don't have to think for yourself. When you're in bondage and you're in captivity, somebody else tells you what to do. When you're in jail, they tell you when you eat. They tell you when you get up. But when you get free, you have to learn how to think for yourself. And there are a lot of us that when God sets you free from something, you want to go back to the very thing that you came from because somebody was thinking for you. You were like Geppetto and the puppet where he was controlling you. And some of you would rather be controlled than to learn how to think for yourself. So he got out. They got out. But when they got out of the wilderness, it found, it, they found out that they had to start thinking for themselves and they had to start depending on themselves and they started to act ignorant. 
And this is the thing that, that uh, uh, Joanna, I don't want anybody to miss it because I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about some of the people you can to. It ain't about you. Y'all not ignorant. It's not y'all. I'm just talking about somebody else. It has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Just look at somebody and say, it's nothing to do with you. You're not ignorant. You're educated. You're wonderful, wonderful people. But there's sometimes we do ignorant things. It ain't you. We do ignorant things. Here it is that these spies had come back. This is why the people rose up. These spies had come back from the land. They went to go get a view and said, we can actually overcome this. We can actually be something great. But then y'all know that the 10 spies said, no, we can't. But two people, Caleb and Joshua said this last week, Caleb and Joshua said, yes, I went too, and we can overcome it. And y'all know what Caleb did that was last week. If you missed it, get the podcast. You can find it or get on YouTube. You can find it too. He said, I, I, I believe we can overcome this. But 10 other people said, no, we can't. And they believe the majority versus the minority. And there are many of us right now who are in the situation we're in is because majority of your friends are wrong. And the minority of your friends that are right, you don't like them. The majority tells you what you want to hear. The minority tells you your stuff stinks and you'll be like, I don't know why they're acting strange about me. They're not acting strange, they're just telling you the truth. Everybody cannot lie to you. You can't hop around from relationships to relationships and keep blaming the other person when it might be you. So they believe the majority and because they believe the majority, they wind up missing the promises of God and they got here and they told Moses leadership, say leadership again. Leadership. They stole leadership. They said, you brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to struggle. It would be best for this is this is what bothered me, Pastor Gilm. This is what bothered me, Corey. This is what bothered me. It might not bother y'all, but it's just stuck out to me. And I said, oh, my God, this is so ignorant. This is what was ignorant to me is that they said, you brought us out here to die. Then they looked at each other, Rock, and they said, we need to find a leader that can take us back. <laughs> y'all missed it. They got there in the wilderness. Then they said to they, they spoke against leadership and then they said to each other, we need to find somebody that can take us back where we came from. Now, this is what's ignorant about that. This is what's ignorant. You mean to tell me you had a leader to take you out of bondage, but now you need a leader to take you back because you don't even know how to go back. You don't even know how to get back into what you got delivered from, so you need a new leader to take you back to bondage. Ignorance. Do y'all hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? He said, you asked the Lord to deliver you. You got delivered. You had a leader for that. Now you want a leader to go back? Leader means influence. So now I, I needed somebody to influence me that I could experience better. Now I need somebody to influence me to tell me that the better I have ain't for me. Now I need somebody to influence me to take me back to the bondage that I was in because it was better. Ignorance. How do you need a leader to teach you how to do wrong? Lord have mercy. How do you need a leader to be able to teach you how to go back to what you got delivered from? What that means is, Kendra, is that he said, a leader sets you free. Guillaume, he said, a leader sets you free. I'm trying to make this make sense. A leader sets you free. You didn't do anything to be set free. But in order to go back to bondage, you're going to have to work to do that. Do you know that the misery that some of you are in, you are working to stay there? The depression that you're dealing with, that some of you say, well, it's just that time of the month. It's not that time of the month. It's your time of mind. Sometimes we blame stuff. We blame stuff that we don't want to take ownership for. It's better for me to blame it on somebody else than for me to take ownership of it myself and say it's not Aaron, it's not Moses, it's me. So they got out there and they wanted a leader to take them back. 
That's ignorance, and I, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there's ignorance for you to be able to get to the point where you got set free, got delivered, and then want to go back. He said you got to be detoxed from ignorance. The second thing you got to be detoxed from is illusions. Happy Mother's Day. You got delivered from ignorance. Next thing you got to be delivered from, uh, from illusions. I got a scripture for it. You want to hear it? Here it goes. Here it is. Exodus, the 16th chapter, verse 2 through 3. And then it says the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, we wish, here they go again, we wish that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. Because what, and this is the Lord, the Bible is funny to me. It may not be funny, y'all. He says, we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. I wish we were there. <laughs> Jeff, hear this. He says, because when we were in Egypt, we had meat pots. We ate bread to the full. And now you brought us out here to the wilderness to be hungry. Ooh, Lord have mercy. I'm telling you, I am a comedian. God, you are funny. This is so funny to me because it is interesting to me is that when we get out of a situation, all of a sudden what you came out of looks better than what you in. The illusion was, the illusion, the illusion, they shine. this is an illusion. He said, we're out here in the wilderness. We're hungry. We don't know where our food is going to come from. But at least we were in bondage, we had food. At least when we were in Egypt, we had food to eat. So you mean to tell me that being oppressed and being fed by your oppressor, it sounds better to you than you depending on God. Lord Jesus help me today I preach this better in my mind than I am today I promise you I wish my, my mind the Eminem I wish the real Mario would please stand up please stand up I'm telling y'all some of you all right now the illusion is that some of what you were in seems better than what the transition that you're in right now I'll break it to your home I'm, I'm making more make it more sense to you there's some of you who are now in this season of life right now where God is teaching you stuff but there are some of you who said well, I wish I were back at the church I was at because at least the choir had more members than we do here. <laughs> I wish that I was at the church I came from. The church wasn't paid for. We were in debt. But at least we never had healing. At least we never had deliverance. At least I knew what to expect because there was never any life there. I wish I could go back to the pastors that, 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 that you can't trust. I, I would rather go back to that because that seems better than trying to learn something new. I would rather go back to manipulation because at least I knew they were a manipulator. I would rather go back to somebody slapping me in domestic violence and at least I knew I would have flowers the next day. I would rather go back to being seen. I'd rather go there than to stay single. I would rather go back to church when we had praise breaks every Sunday. We never got delivered. We never got set free. We never learned anything about the word, but we had a good time. I would rather go back to that because the illusion is where you came from. It's better than the transition that you're in right now. Somebody say transition. I come to speak to you while you're in transition right now. You don't have to clap. You don't have to run. You don't have to flip. But I'm coming to speak to you while you're in transition. Somebody say transition. And there are some of you that you're not where you should be, but you're not where you were. But you're in the middle in between and you're still longing for what you came from because all of a sudden it looks better than what you're at. I wish I would go back to the place I came from because at least the place I came from, we had food. And now I got food stamps. I got more children than I got money to pay. I would rather go back to that man who I knew I wasn't the only woman, but at least he came home and he brought his check home for me. And when he brought his check, at least I knew I had enough money for me to be able to bling to make sure that the 4th of July I could dress my children to go over there to Douglas Park or somewhere for everybody to see them. At least I could live like I was front, like everything was fine and everything was not fine because I knew I was only the woman for this play, but I wasn't the woman at home. I knew that, but it was better for me to be shared than for me to be lonely. I'd rather go back to the church where I knew that the pastor was not going to challenge me. 
He only preached 20 minutes, and I knew what he was going to say before he said it. And I knew after he got through reading his manuscript, then the organ was going to come in. They were like, huh? Whoa. Yes. Friday he died, but he didn't stay there. He stayed there all night Friday, but he, then he stayed there Saturday, but he didn't stay there because early. Did you hear me, church? I said early, 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 and if they were really good, early. I would rather go back to predictable church than to be in a church that makes me feel uncomfortable because God challenges my mind. I, I would rather go back to flaky musicians than to sit here and have to depend on a two-piece. I would rather go to a church that has a five-piece uh, band and they can make us feel good while we in Egypt. I'd rather stay in Egypt because at least I was full. Full on nothing, but full. Taken care of. Am I talking to anybody today? Is there anybody that sometimes you get, and I'm not talking to you all because I haven't experienced it, that I have been in transition points in my life. And when you're in transition, sometimes you make ignorant decisions because of the illusions that you believe. The reason that God brought you out anyway is because he wanted you not to be entangled with that anymore. If he wanted you to go back to it, he would have let you die in it. And there are a lot of us, it's hard for us to unlearn what we've learned. Egypt was easier for me than kingdom. Church talk is easier for me than kingdom. Y'all like, what is kingdom? I'm talking about things that are higher than yours. Kingdom is when somebody slaps your right cheek, you turn your other cheek. Kingdom is when you know what somebody did, you know what they say, but you still pray healing over their life. That's kingdom. That's not church. But some of you know church. When you do me wrong, I do you wrong. Now that's called street. That's not called church. He says, Lord... We have to, in order for us to have a mind detox, we have to be detoxed from ignorance. We have to be detoxed from illusions because what is interesting is that their, their, their ignorance had caused them to make an illusion that Egypt was better than the transition they were in. The last thing you got to be delivered from, and I'm going to be through, the last thing you got to be delivered from is being impaired. You got to be detoxed from from uh, you got to be detoxed from ignorance you got to be detoxed from illusions and lastly you got to be detoxed from being impaired what is impaired i got a scripture for it here it goes uh, exodus the 14th chapter verse 12 and it says this quan you can come on i told you i'm not i'm this is mother's day sermon i can't keep them all day because their stomachs are rumbling because you know egypt is a little bit better than what i'm feeding right now so in verse 12 it says it's not this what we said to you in egypt leave us alone that we can serve the Egyptians, but we, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Did not we tell you we didn't want to be delivered? Did I not tell you that I like myself stinking? Did I not tell you that I like church messed up like this? Did I not tell you that this is what I'm used to? And you did not leave me where I was and you kept pulling me to Jesus and I said, I don't want him, I want church. Did I tell you that I like the traditional churches because at least they don't change? Did I not tell you that Lexington is a traditional city? Did I not tell you that the pastors don't pray, they just preach? Did I not tell you not to stir up my marriage and tell me to start getting myself together? Why did you tell me to get married? I like living together. It was more convenient. Why? 
why would you raise up a church in Growth Point that would not be like the other churches that are here? We were doing just fine before you got here. We were doing just fine until you start messing with my mind. Did I not tell you to leave me in Egypt? My church was historic. We had guest preachers that came in that took the money but never changed us. Why would you tell, I'm speaking to spirits today and I want you to understand why I'm preaching the way I am. I see your face, but I'm preaching to your spirit. I understand the spirit and the warfare that is going on in this city that nobody wants to change, keep it the same. Dress nice, look nice, shout nice, have a good choir, but don't change. Keep it the same way. I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. And you don't do nothing. <laughs> have flyers. Have conferences. Invite everybody in. We're not going to change. We just like to be entertained. Did I not tell you that that's what Lexington was about? Did I not tell you that as soon as you started to, uh, Guillaume, Pastor Guillaume told me this other day, and my wife, we were talking about this, and, 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 and they were telling me, and some people right now in the church are a little upset right now because a lot of pastors in the city are talking about me and are saying a whole bunch of stuff about me. And a lot of people said that the reason that I, I had all this stuff and the reason I had singleton on my back is because I struggle with homosexuality anyway, and they ain't out of me. My wife don't know I'm actually gay and all this stuff. And I, y'all, y'all all that stuff no no please no I know it's all right but what I'm saying to you today is this one thing the reason that they're talking is because everything was okay until you start stirring up stuff because if I'm preaching truth over here that means you're gonna see a lie over there I ain't gay I've been delivered for a long time you the one who's down under you got the wrong one do you know how many people walk around me me and my wife and they waiting for the truth to come out the truth is out look at me I am bona fide I am certified I love me a good woman now tweet it But Egypt churches like things the same way. Keep it the same way so we can have a big church and we can all ride around nice, but ain't nobody changing and ain't nobody doing nothing. But I came to make an announcement, Brother Jeff. The devil is a liar. I don't want to raise no more graveyards. I don't want to raise no more traditional churches. I want people's children to be better. I want people's marriages to be whole. I want the homosexual to come in here and get delivered. But they can't be delivered if I'm judging. You can't be set free if I'm judging. The Bible says with loving kindness have I drawn you, not with judgment. Take your mouth off of some of these people and do kingdom work. Somebody just said I'm mad. I'm not mad. I'm just turning over tables. Stop doing what God did not say. Now that's real church. Real church is when you go into the city and you say, take your mouth off of my uncle. My uncle's going to put down the bottle eventually. My uncle's going to stop smoking eventually. You stop judging him and help him. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm tired. Harriet said, I would have freed a thousand more. If they knew they were only slaves and I'm sitting here, I am tired of going to people's churches in Lexington and everybody's enslaved. Everybody's sitting here, everybody's sitting there talking about and going through the motions. 
By and by, Lord, when the morning comes, when all the, everything's always in the far distant future. Soon no will be done with the troubles of the world. Everything's always talking about what I will have, but nobody's teaching about what I can have right now. I don't want to keep shouting about the breakthrough I can't have. I can have breakthrough right now. Look at somebody say I can have it right now. <laughs> so here, verse 12. They were sitting there and they said, leave us alone that we may serve Egyptians for it would have been better for us to stay in the wilderness. And he said, you got to be detached from being impaired. Now, what is being impaired means? Impaired means being damaged. Because when you're damaged, you are paralyzed. And one thing that faith is not, Pastor Cummings, is that faith is not paralyzed. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. And there's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not paralyzed. But there are some of you who you are seeing through impaired lenses. That's why they give people glasses. Because your, your vision is impaired. And when your vision is impaired, you can't see right. Impairment means damage. There's certain parts of my eyes that are damaged, that are prohibiting, that are prohibiting me from seeing clearly. And there are some of you who God has an assignment for your life, but you cannot see clearly because your vision is impaired. What does impaired mean? It means I don't trust people. What does impaired mean? I can't connect with this church because I don't trust it yet. What does being impaired mean? I cannot serve because the last place I served looked over me. I cannot get involved because if you find out how nasty I really am, you won't want to use me. Impaired. I can't give to the church because I don't trust the last church I was at. I gave all my money and they didn't do nothing with it. But just but we changed locations 15 times and we still ain't got nothing to show for it. Impaired. Somebody say impaired. That means I was damaged somewhere. And I don't know who I'm talking to today that's been damaged by somebody. I, my assignment, my assignment is not to make you happy in Egypt. There are plenty of churches I could point you to where they're having a great time celebrating graveyards. Everything's still the same. My assignment is to make sure that you deal with your impairment. So here in verse 13, Moses said to the people, he said, your vision is, your vision is impaired. He said, you've got to be delivered from being damaged. You can't operate being damaged. When you start being damaged, you start looking at people strange. When you're damaged, you start critiquing people. When you're damaged, you start judging people. When you're damaging people, when you're damaged, you damage other people. Because when you're hurt, you hurt other people. People are trying to get close to you and people are trying to love you, but you won't let them love you because you're so damaged. And there's some of you who you are more than what you're settling for, but you can't believe it because you're so damaged. Is this helping anybody? He said, I'm damaged. I'm shouting, but I'm damaged. I'm jumping, but I'm damaged. I'm here, but I'm damaged. I believe what you're saying, but my damage doesn't allow me to hear you completely because I'm damaged. So when you talk to me, I think it's from God, but I really think it's from you because I think you saw what I posted. So I can't really hear you because I think you lurking on me. That's a word that's beyond those who are 65. It's for the, for the, the younger generation. Like lurking? What are you talking about lurk? Because when I was lurking, girl, what I... Mm. <laughs> He said, he says, you got to be set free from being impaired. And verse 13 says, and Moses said to the people, he says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Now, this same stand firm, didn't we hear that earlier in Galatians? He said, Christ has set you free. 
He says, so stand firm. So now Moses is saying the same thing. He says, he said, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. What he was saying is, he said, you didn't fight your, he said, you didn't do anything to get yourself out of deliverance. You didn't do anything to get yourself out of Egypt. So now that you're out here, I know Pharaoh is trying to chase you. He said, but stand firm. And there are some of you who have a problem with that stand firm thing. Because you move too much. Every time something goes wrong, you're ready to move. Every time somebody does something that's questionable, you're ready to drop out and stop. I ain't got time for this. I ain't going to do this. And all this stuff because you're in transition. And he says, stand still, which means you don't have to fight. This is the thing, Joanna, that I don't want anybody to miss. He says, stand still, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which the Lord will work for you. He said, for the Egyptians that you see today, you won't see them again. This is the last part. Verse 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. But here, all you got to do is be silent. Claudia, I'm preaching better than these hats are looking. I know I am. <laughs> he said, <laughs> they look good. He said, stand still for the Egyptians that you see today, you're not going to see them anymore. What that means, Brother Matt, is, is that those of you who are fighting something and something is trying to chase you, he said, if you stop fighting it and stand still and be quiet, you'll see the salvation of the Lord. You'll see the deliverance of the Lord, but you've got to be quiet. Someone say, be quiet. And there's some of you who don't like to be quiet because you've got so much to say. Your mouth is getting you in trouble. Put a muzzle on it. When somebody tries to say something, like, <laughs> like what you saying? No. <laughs> you need to put a muzzle on it and let God fight for you. The Lord will fight for you if you be quiet. He says, what's chasing you will be handled if you take your hand off of it. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Another scripture says, he says, for the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And there are some of you right now that you're in transition and you're in a spot, but because you're impaired and your vision is the way that it is, you think that God's calling you to fight when actually God's calling you to be quiet. I know what the report is and I know what the doctor said, but the word for the Lord is today is be quiet. Stop talking so much, not even to other people. Stop talking to yourself. Some of you are saying stuff to yourself that's not even true. And you have made an illusion in the midst of a wilderness. And God's saying your vision is impaired because you start making ignorant decisions and you did ignorant things. Now you got these illusions and now your vision is impaired and you can't see me because you're so impaired and so damaged. But somebody lift your hands and say, God, heal my vision. Somebody say it again. God, heal my vision. I want you to holler out loud and say, God, heal my vision. God, I want to see what you want me to see. God, I want to be what you want me to be. God, I want to operate the way you want me to operate. I want to have good relationships with my brothers. I want to have good relationships with my sister. God, heal my vision. Somebody say it again. God, heal my vision. If you would allow God to heal you, you can be all that he would have for you to be. If you would allow God to heal you, you can trust again. If you would allow God to heal you, you would be able to witness to people. But you can't witness to people that you don't trust. Say, God, heal my vision. Tired of being impaired. Tired of walking around limping. Tired of walking around not trusting. I'm tired of the same old stuff that was in Egypt. I can't be damaged no more. If I stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, will you stand to your feet all over the building? And I want you to look at a few people and say, be healed. Look at a few other people and say, be healed. I don't know what you need healing from. I don't know what it is that you need today. And I don't know where it is that you are.